From some intense showdowns. That's not going out, look at this oil. To people just plain making a mockery of the kitchen. We took it as a team. I ain't gonna go we back and forth with you, baby. Likewise, because it's, it's, it's fruitless. Here are a few times when the chefs lost it on MasterChef. Seriously, though. As I'm sure you all know, MasterChef is known to constantly push contestants to their limit, both in terms of culinary skill and in terms of drama. And if I had to pick one, I'd say season five was probably one of the most volatile, and all of that came down to pretty much a single person. Yeah, it was none and only Leslie. One of the most memorable contestants of all time, in no small part due to his pretty strong opinions. Kitchen, diners, cooking, I think it's more of a guy thing. I don't want to insult anybody, but I just don't see it happening with the girls. During a particularly challenging task, Leslie found himself on the blue team, led by Daniel, and together they were tasked with dividing the team into men versus women. Additionally, the idea seemed reasonable, with equal opportunity to share perspectives with the other gender. However, as the challenge progressed, tension began to rise. Leslie, these eggs look different every time I see them. You gotta keep that plating consistent, okay? They're, they're sunny side up, that's the way they make them. Leslie was assigned the crucial task of preparing the eggs, a seemingly simple chore that turned into a nightmare. Halfway through the process, he discovered they were too oily. And Leslie is taking it very personal, and that's reflecting in the next 20 plates he puts in the window. Meanwhile, Daniel was adamant about maintaining the highest standards, refusing to serve anything less than perfection. That's not going out, look at this really? oil. Left oil, Leslie, left oil. And the next thing you know, everything started to go downhill. The clash between Leslie's insistence on proceeding despite imperfect ingredients and Daniel's commitment to quality quickly escalated into a hell of an argument. Do not let him make it out here without it being perfect. Are you kidding me? I'm busting my ass here, working three different areas. Leslie refused to back down, while Daniel became increasingly frustrated with the guy. After all, it was his circus and monkeys at the end of the day. I gotta go into the freaking oven and pull out the bacon and the sauces, did two burning hot trays, and I gotta worry about burning my freaking hands, and he's yelling at me? And to make things worse, at the heart of their conflict was a fundamental breakdown in communication. Leslie failed to communicate effectively about the challenges he was facing, while Daniel struggled to listen and empathize. Leslie, do you need help? I'm good right now. If you stop talking to me, I'll be good. We need to communicate, Leslie. In the end, both men dug their heels in, each convinced that they were in the right. I need those eggs. They're coming, Willie. They're coming. I can't make them cook any faster. As the argument spiraled out of control, it became evident how a lack of communication really wrecked havoc on their team dynamics. I'm working the toast because I need toast on my plate. I need the eggs on the plate. Instead of collaborating to solve the problem, Leslie and Daniel found themselves locked in a battle of wills, each unwilling to compromise or see beyond their own point of view. Daniel at least attempted to reason with Leslie by empathizing the importance of communication and teamwork, but his words fell on deaf ears. Meanwhile, Leslie, who was running on frustration and a desire to prove himself above all else, remained defiant and unwilling to accept any criticism or feedback. I mean, what were you expecting? It's Leslie we're talking about here. I don't think yeah. I've hurt anybody or made any enemies. No? I think that's working for me, <laughs> except for Leslie, who's cackling right here, because he doesn't know how to be a grown-up, even though he's the oldest man here. He's a child. Anyway, just like you expected, their inability to effectively communicate and collaborate proved costly for the team. Dishes went unserved, tempers flared, and as a consequence, the entire team morale suffered from it. You know, if Daniel's quick to criticize, but he's not quick to help. See, it goes without saying that transparent and effective communication is paramount no matter what you're doing, but particularly in critical scenarios like every day on MasterChef. Ultimately, Leslie and Daniel's clash was a hell of a cautionary tale. You want to bring ego and stubbornness into the situation? Well, best of luck. And mind you, both of the contestants had their own share of those traits. Thanks to the pressure they were under and the expectations the judges had for them, not seeing eye to eye was their joint downfall. I'm loving it. There's no pressure here. I'm just, I'm just, this is another walk in the park for me. Shut up and cook. Well, no wonder then that Daniel and Leslie both really fumbled their chances of winning the competition, when just talking was all they needed to get things back on track. Now, like that last example, this challenge from season 
season 8 put more than skill to the test. Yet again, the judges were putting the finger on the pulse of their contestants' leadership skills. Divided into two teams like last time, they were tasked with serving a multi-course meal at a vineyard, where local food critics would sample their dishes. Ebony and Jason, since you both had the best dishes in that last challenge, you'll both be team captains. Please, step up here. Leading the teams were Ebony and Jason, each responsible for guiding their respective teams to victory. I've never been on a losing team for a field challenge, and today I want to show great leadership and just excel myself right into the top five. From the outset, the blue team, under Ebony's leadership, faced challenges with both coordination and cohesion. Okay. It's gonna solve something. I'm about to clean his ass. Don't worry about what's happening, all right? Let's just focus and talk about hey, how you we finish. we gotta shut up and play, because I'm getting annoyed. Little did she know that the team she chose for herself really wasn't jiving. Who's your pick? This individual, they have a phenomenal palette and they know how to play on a team, Kate. Wow, Kate. As the team members were selected, tensions started simmering beneath the surface. To make things worse, there was a complete lack of clear direction and unity. If you want to yell at somebody, yell at them to correct them, not to make them feel stupid. That's not going to lead us to victory. Despite Ebony's best efforts, the team struggled to find its rhythm, leading to a disappointing loss in the challenge. I cannot believe that we're serving undercooked food. Jeff is a loser, and that's why he's always been on a losing team. But guess what? Again, like last time, Jeff found himself at the center of conflict during the challenge. And who better to hash things out with than their leader? But before that, Jeff was pretty much the target of all the team's woes. Service! Service! Damn, Jeff. Please, just stop it, okay? Yeah, just let's leave just get it. it done. All right. We got it done. Labeling him a curse and laying into him at every opportunity throughout the challenge. So let's hope that Jeff's mistakes were not that bad to make us lose. And well, as if this example and the last were completely identical, you can't expect the best results when team members fail to communicate effectively. While the kitchen was being scrubbed down and cleaned, tensions between Ebony and Jeff were only escalating. It's not one person's fault. <laughs> Jeff is bad luck. There's nothing else to say. Ebony accused Jeff of having an attitude and not following her instructions. While Jeff pushed back, defending everything he did and asserting his independence. You gonna look like an idiot. You stand up, cry, whine, bitch and moan, complain. It's everybody else's fault but Jeff. I'm all right. The conflict reached its climax when Ebony brought her grievances to the judges painting Jeff as arrogant and defiant. I know why Jeff is always on a losing team, because when he gets instruction, he still wants to do what Jeff wants to do instead of follow suit with what's best for the team. In response, Jeff argued that Ebony's leadership style was too authoritarian, stifling creativity and innovation. Anytime that there was anything that needed to be done, I did it. The negativity centered from the top down. Instead of trying to empower, it was a push down type of a leadership style, one that is unsuccessful for anything that's going to be of a master okay, chef willingness. Now, this is when Ramsey highlighted the importance of collaboration and mutual respect in a team setting, pointing out that Ebony's approach lacked flexibility and understanding. The problem with the blue team, we worked against each other. And the feedback and the amount of sh that Christina had to take in the dining room was extraordinary. We've said it time and time again that these challenges get tougher and tougher, and only the strongest will survive. Ramsey couldn't help but notice how the team became divided, working against each other rather than as a cohesive unit. This lack of teamwork and synergy was what ultimately led to their downfall. At the end of the day, we as a team, we failed. The three of us are going to be battling out, and we're just going to have to do what we got to do. That's it. So if I haven't already beaten this horse to death, maybe try communicating the next time you're working in a group setting. Looking at you, all those people in high school who made me do the group project all by myself. But personal, traumatic experiences aside, let's get back to the topic at hand. If only Ebony was a little more flexible and tried to adapt her leadership style to the dynamics of the team, who knows? Maybe all the cooperation and support could have eventually paid off. But what happened in this next challenge was even crazier, and a little more original, hopefully. So the contestants were tasked with cooking for firefighters, and it's a team challenge again. Apologies for stringing you along there, but there's some really juicy stuff in these. Now, Bowen was leading red and Caesar was leading blue. I've been captain once in the first team challenge and I lead my team to be success. My strategy is simple. 
just kick his ass. Uh, well, let's just agree to disagree for now, why don't we? But wait till you see if picking the protein first turns out to be the right choice for Bowen, or if the universe was gonna test his mettle. Bowen, are you choosing your protein first or your team first? I wanna choose my protein. Okay. We are top eight. Everybody can cook, so the protein is more important than the team. Which one are you going to pick? Seabed. And there it is. Right there was the first step to losing. Having such a gross lack of faith in his team. I'm looking at our red team. Janica and Samantha can cook. But I have been on a team with Bowen as my captain. He gets frazzled and loses his mind. Hopefully we don't go down in flames. Well, I couldn't agree more with Joe. As much as it hurts me to say that. You just gotta pick your people right. I think it was a foolish decision to go with choosing a protein first. You have to choose your team first. Because those are the people who are gonna affect the quality of the dish. Despite facing challenges throughout the challenge, including questions about Bowen's leadership and the team's efficiency, the red team eventually managed to serve 25 plates. Hello, everybody. In front of you, you each have a dish from the red team and a dish from the blue team. However, when the final verdict came, it was the blue team who emerged victorious. Yeah! <laughs> we did it. They love my lamb. I had so much pressure on my shoulders today, but it paid off. Who didn't see that coming? As the teams cleaned up after the challenge, tensions reached a boiling point when Ashley threw down regarding Bowen's leadership being the sole cause behind the team's loss. Of course, we lost. Bowen killed our team, and I'm living. With absolutely no hesitation whatsoever, and like all those who came before her, she laid the blame squarely at Bowen's feet. You were putting oil in pan, you were putting butter in pan, I mean, because you Shanika, you Shanika okay. had to step up and cook. Her. Bowen, on the other hand, was unwilling to accept responsibility for the loss, and instead challenged Ashley, asserting his confidence in his abilities and his intention to outperform her in the next challenge. I made the <laughs> and you have you do everything correct, so we will figure out tomorrow pressure test. Let's go. While Bowen was quick to defend himself and shift blame onto the others, Ashley's willingness to confront the issue head on and hold him accountable really showed a high level of integrity and honesty. I'm disappointed. We lost because we just lack communication. Bowen shut down. Let's go. If there's anybody that can handle a pressure test, it's me. Joe, you won't lose another apron today. I guarantee you that. However, the lack of collective accountability within the team ultimately came in the way of learning from their mistakes and moving forward together. Shanna is busting out sea bass. We got enough fish. She is handling her station like a freaking pro. While we're at it, let me remind you that when people within a team are unwilling to acknowledge their role in setbacks or failures, everybody's gonna get defensive and resentful. Which, of course, comes at the cost of team morale. I think the judge is criticizing Bowen just put a dent in his freaking confidence. We can't afford this today. Everything has to be perfect. True leadership involves not only making decisions and giving direction, but also owning up to mistakes, learning from them, and leading by example. And that's something that Bowen failed to understand. When do we put the oil in? When you're ready to cook. Thank you. Can you tell him, please? Yes. Don't put the oil in until him? you're ready to put the fish on. Yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Is there any oil in these pans? Oh, guys, come on. As the competition progressed, it became evident that only the team who had a strong leader at the helm had the tools to overcome challenges and achieve success. I love Bowen, but he's getting a little frazzled. I'm he has to step in and help put this fire out right now. While conflict and disagreements are inevitable in any team setting, how everyone chooses to address and resolve it can make all the difference in the team's overall performance. But you know what? It's easier said than done. Now, I'm sure you all know the pressure that the contestants are constantly under to perform at their best. However, in season 5, one contestant, and trust me, we're finally getting to an individual thing here, set a new standard for defensiveness and rudeness in the face of criticism. I'm not following. What's the discussion here? What don't you agree with? It's not that I don't agree, okay? Let's change that, okay? Let's get that straight. During a particular baking challenge, the judges approached Cutter to taste his dish. So far, so normal, right? But instead of receiving feedback with grace and humility, Cutter immediately went on the defensive, throwing a massive fit when his dish came under some serious scrutiny. And the next thing you know, his expression turned angry and even more defensive. I mean, he flat out refused to accept the judge's critique. Moist, delicious, but it is so sweet. I mean, take a little bite. 
and just get a little gist of what I'm saying. It's sticking to the roof of my mouth and on my first mouthful. You've cooked the sponge beautifully. However, it's about that ratio and you've got to get that balance right. And this wasn't the first time Cutter reacted defensively to criticism of his dishes. Throughout the competition, Cutter constantly demonstrated a pattern of defensiveness. He refused to acknowledge the judges' feedback more often than not. Damn. And this behavior not only came in the way of his own growth and improvement, but also made it an ordeal to even share the space with him. I think it's a good cake. I don't think it's too sweet. Uh, I have to disagree with Chef Ramsay. I think it actually tastes pretty good to me. I think just everybody has a different palate. But leave it to Joe to put all the cards on the table, whether everyone at the table is willing to or not. Are you the kind of guy who lives in, in a delusion? Like, if any time we tell you something, you're going to become so defensive. He got in Cutter's face about questioning the credibility of the judges and their expertise. And I don't have to tell you how serious an accusation this was. After all, the judges are bringing some serious experience with them. Except Joe. But either way, they hold everyone's fate in their hands all the same. Look, I'm on the edge of going home. I'll be honest with you, I'm on the edge of going home. Baking sucks for me. While it's understandable that contestants invest a significant amount of time, effort, and emotion into their creations, reacting defensively to criticism is ultimately counterproductive. Because I do feel like I put my passion and my heart into everything I put in. If you think Gordon's pal is terrible, you're allowed to That's think that. That's not what I said at all. Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> After all, you're being rude to the very people who decide whether you cook or go home. But even taking any potential skewed judgment out of the picture, to have any chance at success, it's essential for contestants to be open to feedback. And more importantly, for them to be willing to learn from their mistakes. Cutter's just sitting there shooting himself in the foot. Why would you mouth off to Joe? Why would you have anything to say other than yes, sir? Nobody's getting to the finale on spite and tradition alone. You gotta learn and grow for them to even glance in your direction. And if you're an asshole, well, that's spoiling things even more. And Cutter was clearly asking for trouble. I think that you have to have respect for us and our opinions of what we talk I'm trying my damnedest. All I do is get hammered. All you do is interrupt me when I'm talking to you, and you sound ignorant, Cutter. Well, their decision makes me believe that, fortunately, the judges aren't as biased as people claim them to be sometimes. I mean, his brazen attitude wouldn't have gotten him anywhere but out of the show if it was a popularity contest. However, he managed to stick around because of just being a little bit better than the worst. Damn it, cousin. Let's be honest. Both cakes had their ups and downs. However, there was one that has the edge. A person that will be safe from elimination and not leaving the biggest culinary competition anywhere in the world tonight. So, do you think the decision was fair or uh, even made sense? Cousin. See, I get that it all comes down to food, but if you ask me, I'd give equal points to the attitude. You see, being overly defensive can kinda spoil the entire show. For the contestants and judges, sure, but nobody wants to watch a one-man dick measuring contest when they flip on MasterChef at the end of the day. If they wanted that, there's, well, more direct avenues. So, creativity, collaboration, and kindness, right? Well, Cutter had none of the above. Like I mentioned at the top of this section, Cutter was pulling the same shit pretty much every episode he was on. I don't know what they taste like, but I don't know what they are. Do you are. know what balsamic vinegar is? It's the black salad dressing. All he had to do was receive feedback gracefully and respond constructively, and maybe learn a thing or two along the way. But Cutter was here to show off, not to learn. I was just trying to get some color on the plate. According to him, he was perfect. Couldn't tell you what might be coloring that decision, but well, call it arrogance or ignorance, it certainly didn't win him any awards. Just let me interrupt you there. An artisan pizza. Well, that's what the I menu says when I go to the pizza restaurant that I like. Right, well, first of all, I feel like I'm a kid's party and some mini pizzas come out. Maybe describe it again and I'll try and hear it this okay, time. Although it's natural to feel a sense of pride and attachment to the things that you make and do, you gotta remember that criticism is never a personal attack, at least on this show. Rather, a door being held open, providing the opportunity for growth. But well, Cutter wasn't interested in any of that frou-frou nonsense. So there wasn't much the judges could do for him at the end of the day. This is a waste of our time and your time in this kitchen. 
it pissed Joe off, it pissed Gordon off, but I thought it tasted good. It'd, be, it'd definitely be a piece of I would order. And that reminds me of this next contestant from season two. Oh, Christian, 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 Christian. What a handful you were. Well, it all started with the mystery box challenge. Three. <laughs> the contestants were tasked with creating one amazing vegetarian dish. But it was going to be a pretty hardcore one, and the contestants weren't too thrilled about the idea. I'm looking around for a meat or a protein, and it's not to be found. It's all vegetables. I'm like, I gotta say, making a vegetarian dish is far harder than cooking meat, so long as you're trying to make a perfectly balanced dish instead of just some greens in a bowl. Either way, as the contestants got busy with the challenge, there was this one contestant who felt threatened by Jennifer's culinary skill. So what did he do? Well, he buried that feeling under a mountain of cockiness. I told Jennifer I think she's a bitch and uh, she's gonna get what she deserves. And wait till you hear what he said next. Thanks if she can cook better than me. I'll cook around on the table any day of the week. Despite Christian's confidence, what he actually produced said otherwise. There was one individual who got tripped up. The lack of protein. But wait, that wasn't all. No meat, no fish. Put that person into obscurity. Ramsey finally revealed who he was talking about and Christian's face dropped to the floor. Christian! And it's got to feel super humiliating to have served the worst dish, especially after acting all high and mighty like he did. And Ramsey definitely took him to task over it. It wasn't cohesive. It wasn't properly thought through. But that's not all. And the whole sort of style of the dish was strange. It wasn't just Ramsey who wasn't a fan. It never is, is it? We didn't expect it from you. It was really something subpar. We were very disappointed. Yeah, not exactly our man's greatest look. But Christian decided it would be an even better idea to fire right back. I think you're wrong. I don't think my dish is the worst dish here. The nerve, I tell you. I mean, no one in their right mind would try and clap back at the judges. I explained that all last section. So I guess that means Christian wasn't exactly sane up there. Especially after serving something as horrendous as this. But what's more, Christian didn't stop at that. He decided to throw more than a few people under the bus for good measure. All the while trying to make himself look like the top dog. Esther's dish look pretty Think what you want. But Joe was done with the nonsense, and he put Christian in his place. Well, you have the right to disagree, but we're telling you the way we see it, and we thought the dish sucked. However, Christian remained adamant. With every criticism that dropped in his direction, he shot back with more and more disagreement. Ramsey's patience was wearing thin, and it wasn't long before that final thread completely snapped. I don't agree with you. Well, we're trying to give you constructive criticism. If you were a man, you'd take it on the chin. What he said next, I don't know, it just really hit different. Unfortunately, your talent's not matching your arrogance. The dish was a letdown. End of story. Yeah, Ramsey was out here needing to spell out the obvious for the guy. The judges were there for a reason, and they wouldn't let anyone, let alone a crappy cook like Christian, belittle them. In the end, MasterChef isn't just about winning the competition, it's about the lessons learned, the friendships forged, and the people who find their passion along the way. But you know, there's always gotta be that one guy who spoils the fun for everyone else. And now, it's my turn to do the same, cause the video's over now. Sorry, but definitely get in the comments if you can think of crazier conferences confrontations that went down between the judges and the home cooks, or between the home cooks and the home cooks, or the judges and the judges. And while you're at it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications too. It really does help me keep the good stuff coming your way. But while you do that, don't forget to check out this next video right here. It's even better.